Hey, what's going on? My name's Lucas. Welcome to my studio. In this video, I'm going to be walking you through a full on drum production for a metal track that I just started producing, along with my dear friends Colin Cook, who's playing guitar and singing vocals, and Ruben Gingrich, who's playing drums. And Ruben just came through yesterday to my home studio and laid everything down. We're still in the middle of writing and producing this track, so none of the vocals or guitars are finished yet. They're really just in the demo stage, but as far as drums are concerned, I really want to get an awesome drum sound so we can build the record around that. Another thing that's kind of cool is that I'm doing this whole production in Ableton Live, so I've gotten some comments asking me to talk more about pop, rock, and metal production in Ableton Live because it is Definitely designed a little bit more for electronic producers, but I really like the workflow and the musicality of the program, so I think it works really well even for large recording projects like this one. I like to keep my drum workflow very, very structured because it can get really confusing and overwhelming. The way that it works is I'll do my recording, I'll do the comping with the drummer there because I wanna make sure we're both on the same page about what takes we're using for different sections. And then after that, I'll start doing editing. So it's really important to get the editing out of the way, save that as a separate file. Then once you have things edited down, you can start working on time aligning things as needed, and then you can start working a little bit more heavily on mixing. So that's gonna kind of be my process. Definitely check out my website if you're interested in downloading this exact drum tracking template. And I do have dedicated videos to setting all that up if you're curious about that. But for today, we're gonna jump right into the editing. All right, so here's a snippet of what our little demo track sounds like. Check it out. Cool, yeah, so we were going for like a heart of a coward, a little bit of loathe inspired vibe. I've already gone ahead and comped everything with Ruben, our drummer there, to make sure we're on the same page. But just so you see how that process goes, you wanna just make sure all your tracks are linked by selecting all of them and hit link. That way if you edit anything, it will do it consistently on all of them. And you can select all of them and hit option command U to open up the take lanes. And this is where you're gonna choose your takes and hit enter and it will move it up into the main take. And then we can hide that with the same key command. So the next order of business is to go in to all the little edits and just make sure that it sounds good when you play through the drum track soloed. You wanna make sure you have crossfades here and that each of the comps sound seamless. Another thing that sometimes you may have to do depending on the client, if they have music that has like repeated sections or loop sections, you may take a good part of the sequence and cut it and move it around to another section too. So that might be another option if you want your drums sounding really perfect. So once we're happy with the comps and the edits, what I'm gonna do is I'm actually going to just save that as so we have different versions in case anything goes wrong, you can always go back to that comping session. Now I'm gonna select the entire region of the song and hit Command J to join everything together, which is gonna consolidate it and we're gonna get a nice clean audio file to begin the rest of our editing process. 
The next order of business is to edit our Tom tracks as well as the hi-hat mic. There are some little plugins and different tricks that you can use to uh, help you make this go a little quicker, but I like good old fashioned audio editing for these. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna listen to the toms soloed and just erase any audio regions that do not have tom fills because the toms are gonna be kind of rattling and resonating throughout the take and we don't want that in our mix. And we're also gonna do the same thing with the hi-hats. I'm gonna trim the audio so that any sections that do not have hi-hat, we don't need the hi-hat mic for that, at least for this particular project. So all this can be a little bit time consuming depending on how you know, many tom fills and hi-hat sections there are in the song, but for the most part, I like doing regular audio editing um, to, to achieve this rather than using any fancy plugins because I think it just works a little bit better. So first, we're gonna do toms. What I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna unlink them from the group and then link them again so that our toms are linked together. You may wanna actually just do one at a time, but to make things a little bit quicker, I'm just gonna do both of them and I'm gonna edit these down. And then I'm gonna do the same thing with the hi-hat track. So this is what my session looks like with edited toms and edited hi-hats. So as you can see, I've meticulously edited each of these tom hits with the fade at the beginning and the end, preserve the transient, and it sounds a little goofy soloed when you're not hearing the entire kit, but these close mic'd toms are really going to use to get the punch out of the toms. Now what we're going to do is we're going to grab all our tracks and link them back together. So we're going to hit link here, and then we're going to consolidate everything one more time so we can go to the next phase of editing, which is going to be time aligning and gridding everything up. So this is something that you may not want to do for your particular genre of music. I think for our vibe for this track, we're going for like a digital metal type thing. So it's going to be very gridded. And uh, there's some projects where I don't do this at all. Typically, if you're working in Pro Tools or Cubase or something, what you could do is you could slice all the audio files based off these transients and move around the audio to grid it up that way without having to do any type of warp. Unfortunately, in Ableton, we don't really have that feature, so I rely heavily on warping the audio. So in order for this to work, though, you need to make sure all your tracks are linked and all the audio is consolidated, so everything's the exact same length. What you're going to do is you're going to double-click the kick track and just hit Command-A to select all, and then Command-I to insert warp markers throughout the track. So this will take a second because it's a big project. And now Ableton has inserted warp markers everywhere on every single track. So if we open up any tracks, they're all consistent here. So what I like to do first is I'll go ahead and do my warping for my kick. Then I'll do my warping on my snare top. And then if needed, I can do some warping on the tom fills. But for the most part, I will not touch overheads or any of the room mics. So we're just gonna do the close mics for any type of warping. And I'm gonna make very subtle moves as well because we don't wanna hear any type of artifacts. And I'm gonna keep it in complex mode. I think this one works the best for me. So I'm gonna start on my kick track here. And what we can do is we can grab these warp markers and move things around as needed. If you hold option, it will disregard the grid and you can do that. Uh, off grid, so that's really handy. This can be a bit time consuming depending on the music, obviously, so I'm gonna fast forward some of this. And uh, you just need some practice to get good at this, but uh, it's really not too bad. Ableton has the best warping out there, to be honest, so it's, it ends up sounding really clean, and you can get your stuff as time-aligned as you want, or as loose as you want using that option key command to kind of keep it off the grid as needed. I feel like I'm at a point where I want to get like a nice rough mix going of this drum track. So I'm just going to walk you through some of the effect choices that I'm putting on the tracks. Now keep in mind we're in production for this track so we're going to be re-recording all the guitars and basses and vocals over this drum sound. So I'm going to try to keep it reasonable and not put super crazy CPU intensive plugins on right now. I just want to get a basic drum sound that will be entertaining enough to record over. Um, so let's just go mic by mic and talk about some different choices. Here's kick out with nothing on it. This is what I like to do on kick. We're gonna do a FabFilter Pro G first, so I'm gonna gate the kick, and uh, I really like using that plugin. The next one I'm gonna use is this Transient Master, so I boosted the attack a little and cut the sustain down a bit. And then after that, what I'm doing is I'm EQing out some lows and some mids, boosting the highs a tiny bit. Nothing too aggressive for right now, but I find that there's some mud in this frequency range in the kick drum usually, and I don't need so much bass, so I'll cut it. So that's my little EQ curve. And then I just have a compressor over here doing about 5 dB and boosting some volume. So that's our 
main kick mic. And then our secondary kick mic, which is the kick in. This one is gonna be taking care of kind of the clicky sound. So I've also put a gate on as well and a transient master with, with basically the same settings. And for my EQ curve for this one, I'm just chopping off all the lows and just accentuating the high so we get that click and compressing basically the same amount. So this is gonna sound, with both of these, is gonna sound like this. So we got that nice clicky double bass pedal. The snare, I will not be gating. Uh, I just find that to be a little dangerous if there's ghost notes. And uh, sometimes I like a little bit of hi-hat bleed in the snare as well, just to keep things natural. But I did go for a transient designer, not adjusting sustain at all, just boosting the attack a little bit. You gotta be really careful with these, but I think it sounds pretty good. And uh, for my EQ, not doing anything super aggressive on the snare because I want to retain pretty natural snare sound. So here's what the snare top sounds like. And we'll add in snare bottom as well. Snare bottom I have turned down quite a bit because we don't need to hear it too much. I'm actually gating the snare bottom, so that's a little bit safer because we don't need um, to hear hi-hat or anything else in that one, and we don't really need those for ghost notes too much, but you can mess with that a bit. And then for the snare bottom, I'm boosting some high mids there, and it sounds like this. Let's look at toms real quick. Doing similar things to both of them. Let's see here, just scooping some of the mids cutting out some lows and just boosting the top end so we get this type of sound. And then on both times we do have a bit of compression. I have the attack really slow so I can kind of preserve the transient and the punchiness of them. Let's look at the hi-hat mic. So I'm not doing much on this one at all, just cutting some lows that you may or may not need to do. Here's what the hi-hat mic sounds like. And I have this turned way down too, because obviously, and panned as well, but we're, we're gonna be getting a lot of hi-hat in the overheads. Overheads, I have nothing on them. I like to keep the overheads as raw as I can. Sometimes maybe we'll put some EQ or whatever, but I do not compress them. Otherwise you're just gonna get so much cymbal wash that it's gonna be too much. But here's what our overheads sound like. In this particular recording session, we did a lot of options for room mics, and I put a really similar chain on all of them to kind of get things going. I have the Slate Neve preamp and a Distressor on pretty much all of them to just crush this room sound. And they're all, honestly all turned down by a lot, like minus 17 dB and these two minus 25. So when I do the final mix, I'm gonna kind of go in and decide which room sounds we really need and which ones we don't. And the other thing I'm actually also doing is I'm doing some EQing just to get rid of lows and highs. I may mess with that later, but it's just a starting point to kind of darken it so you don't get so much cymbal. Here's the coals. <laughs> Kind of doing the same vibe. Here's my room far. And the coals in the kitchen. And let's check out the entire sound of the kit. I muted everything on the drum bus so you're hearing just the processing we did. And it's gonna sound like this. Okay, now let's talk about some things that you may or may not want to do on your drum mix bus at this point. So you could do a bunch of different parallel effects and stuff like that. I choose to just do my parallel effects right here directly on the bus, but if you want to use return tracks in Ableton, that's cool. So first of all, so a little bit of multi-band. Um, this I might play with, but I'm just using this to kind of control the low end a little bit. So I find that this plugin really helps me with that. So this is Pro MB. just to kind of tighten things up. The Kush Audio AR1 compressor, a lot of great engineers use this one. It sounds really good. It's actually giving me a lot of volume boost right now. I'm running this in parallel. I wanna be really careful about over compressing just cause it brings the cymbals out. Uh, if you wanna do really, really heavy compression, I'd recommend getting like a parallel setup so you can route your 
um, close mic stuff to the parallel compression and really smash that. Um, so here's the AR1. So really, really awesome compressor. I'm also using another Kush plugin here called Novatron, just boosting saturation here. This one's not doing any compression. So really, really awesome plugins. Saturn, we're doing another stage of multi-band saturation. So nothing happening on the lows or low mids. And then on the, the high mids and highs, we're adding some tape drive. So great plugin for doing that. And then I'm also using a clipper. So standard clip, just doing the soft clip algorithm. You can play around with some of this stuff, but I just want to kind of crush the drums pretty hard for this genre. It's peaking a bit, but we'll uh, look at that in a sec. And then lastly, a little bit of Clarifonic parallel EQ, just adding some focus and some clarity. We really don't want to do too much of this. So before all that, and with all that, Okay, so like I was saying earlier, because I'm gonna go in and track guitars and bass and vocals and stuff, I may actually just save this whole situation. So if you just hit this save button, we can put it in our in our browser and just get rid of this because I know Pro MB is gonna in, uh, incur latency. But another option that you actually have that I do sometimes is I'll create kind of a subgroup like with um, the toms and basically everything that I wanna compress. Basically leaving out anything that has cymbals or room sounds that will get really harsh. So I would label this close mics. And then this channel, we can add some heavy parallel compression there. So that's just my basic rough mix for this. All right, let's talk about doing drum augmentation for this track. I really like using samples to augment the drum kit for a couple reasons. Number one, we can achieve better consistency with the kick and snare hits, especially for this high intensity metal track. The second thing I like using samples for is to help me reduce the need to over process the actual drum recording so we can add specific frequencies that we want to hear without adding too much EQ to the original recordings. And the third thing I like doing is using samples to add a little bit of texture or ambience to the sounds. So we're going to start with the kick and a lot of people will use a Steven Slate drums trigger. Uh, VST plugin to do this, but uh, we can just do it for free in Ableton. So I'm going to show you how to do it here. The only thing is when you use Ableton to do this, it might not be perfectly accurate. So this is what I did. I duplicated the kick in track because I think that one was is going to be a little bit easier for Ableton to hear the rhythms. Then I unlinked it. If you right click, we clicked convert drums to new MIDI track and that leaves you and I can delete this now and that leaves you with this MIDI track. So it registered it as the hi-hat. I'm gonna use this track. I'm gonna erase everything else here. I'm going to get rid of the stock drum rack that Ableton assigned. And then I'm gonna double click this MIDI and I'm gonna move this up to C3, which is the default spot for samples to go to. Now I'm gonna do kick trigger for this track. Okay, so I have a kick that I think will work well for this track, so I'm gonna drag that in here. And let's hear what it sounds like. I'm going to boost these velocities. And make sure the release is set. Now let's hear what this sounds like with all of these. So you may need to do a little bit of MIDI editing, but you get to do this for free without buying any other plugins. Okay, so here's what my finished triggers look like. So just to recap what I did, I duplicated my kick in and my snare top, freeze and flatten them, right click the audio and hit convert to drums. I had to edit the MIDI a little bit, I'm not gonna lie. So the downside to this method is that it requires more manual work. Um, the Steven Slate trigger is probably easier if you wanna just do this faster, but I just wanted to show you that you can just do it for free in Ableton. So each of these, my kick trigger track has a bunch of MIDI here that lines up with the kick. I've already listened through everything soloed to make sure it lines up well. Did some editing to take out some fills and stuff that I didn't really want triggered. So now we can take a listen to this. So I'll show you what it sounds like without triggers first. And with triggers added in.
So I don't want them doing too much. I just want them to augment the kit a little bit so I don't have to over mix the individual mics. My first kick trigger is a George Lever sample that is basically just like a metal kick drum. So it just helps with consistency there. My first snare trigger is also another George Lever snare sample that has a bunch of ambience on it. And then my second snare trigger is actually just like a splice electronic sample that's adding some fizz and some white noise to my snare sample and it's turned way, way down. So I don't really want these to be audible in any way. But I think these really add to the drum sound in the mix. All right, so here's our working production for right now. Cool. 